Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for Friday, October 11th, 2019. I'm your host, Scott Alden. And once again, I, we got a full house today. Joined by lovely co-hosts Lincoln Amherst, Seth Hodge, Rodney Smith, and W. Eric Martin. How's everybody Hi. doing? Did you play all play Tapestry hey. this weekend? <laughs> I still haven't played it. <laughs> I don't have it. I don't have my okay. copy. Lincoln has my copy still. <laughs> I don't even have your copy. Your copy's in Connecticut. Matthew had to borrow it for a convention he was going to teach it at. He'd been promised he'd get it, and I think it showed up just after the convention. So he's like, I don't think it's going to make it. Can you send me yours? I'm like, sure. <laughs> well, the Tapestry um, has been played many, many times here, uh, but I'm moving on. Sorry, Tapestry. <laughs> Bigger and better you, things you. happening. You, you well, you know, really you got colorful, so I don't even you, know if you're talking about. That I know. Well, that yeah, cool. we'll say I, it was like a oh. Steph Hodge game for sure. It was beautiful with, with, the, with all the colors. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, we got a lot of announcements right now. I'll get started with the first thing: is the cardboard caravan, formerly known as the SN Mule Service, is live on Board Game Geek right now. And if you go to that Geek Preview for the SN Preview Spiel 2019, you'll see a pre-order button under games that you can pre-order pick up at BGG Con or direct mail in the lower 48. Is that is that what you said? The lower the lower 48? Contiguous 48 states. Yeah. And we're in partnership with Fun Again on this. So like we're helping them. They're helping us. We're all working together. It's a big team effort. Nice. Uh, so make sure you get your orders in because like we want to know what to get. There's a cutoff date. What is that? That would be October 14th, Lincoln. All right. So that's not very long from now. It's three nope. days, in fact, from the show. Uh, so it's going to be tight. Please get your orders in. Um, because once we get back, then you're like, you pick up stuff and then it's going to be a BGG con for you. So all those amazing, Aqu I think Aquatica, no, is Aquatica being, I don't know, but go check those games out. Like, in fact, there's a filter you can click on that will say, pick up a BGG con. You can just click that and it'll show you all those games. And I think there's over 160 something titles right now. So Aquatica sure does look cool. <laughs> So if everyone going to BGG Con orders 160 games, what in the world are you? That's going to be nuts. I don't know. I don't know. That would be pretty crazy, though. We, yeah, we'll I think that out. hotel would be like a flood. You'd be like. A cardboard catastrophe. All right. Another thing to announce, which we announced on the last show, but in case you didn't watch the last show, and why didn't you? Uh, we have uh, opened the registrations for BGG Spring for 2020. And that is on the Memorial Day weekend. And let me get the dates here because I can't see them. 22nd through the 25th, 2020. And that's at the High Regency DFW in the in the High Region in the DFW airport. And what is the what is the statement, Lincoln? What do we say? It's, if it's if it's in the fall, it's at the uh, ball. It falls at the ball. So I don't want to yeah. confuse people. We're still downtown for 2019. We'll see you there. It's, I think it's been sold out for months. So uh, that's BGG Con. BGG Spring though is like BGG Con in almost every way. Maybe in way, some ways better. I don't know. I think the SDJ games, uh, the newly nominated SDJ games, is one of my favorite parts of BG Spring. We do have confirmation that the Spiel de Jahres judges will be there. The, the jury members will be there on hand to teach the games. That pretty sure that's their, from their mouth. So things, of course, may change, but we'll always have those games there. We will, we will definitely have them. Will we be the hosting another there. charity sale at the same time? Uh, the charity sit. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to basically get into the cycle where spring, we're doing the charity sale in the fall. Actually, I should announce this too. look for the, <laughs> it hasn't been posted yet. This is not a time travel trick. Um, <laughs> silent auction for board game geek, not silent <laughs> virtual. What do you call it? Virtual flea, not virtual flea. Sorry. I'm real confused right now. <laughs> <laughs> the very loud virtual flea. <laughs> That's it's a so virtual much. charity auction hosted on Board Game Geek, like the like the virtual flea or like the ah. other things. But it okay. will be our stuff only on that list, and you can bid and you can bid high. Like, please, it's for a good cause. Cafe Momentum, absolutely good cause. I've talked about coffee, coffee, Cafe Momentum many times before. Um, it is a, a restaurant and charity five hundred one c three that is basically uh, for troubled youths. The youths are troubled in Dallas and these give them an opportunity to work in the restaurant and they give, they, they work through every station. Yeah. They learn a career. Yeah. They basically get a career and it, it's like transformative. Like, and, and there's a lot of numbers to back this all up. It's very, I've seen it in person many times. Um, I'm a huge fan of the charity. I'm really like the owner or the, uh, not the owner, the steward, the founder, Chad um, Hauser. He's a great guy. So 
that money's going to a good cause. Oh, while we're talking conventions, we have two cruises that just opened up. The BGG at Sea for 2020 is going to Japan via Alaska. So we're going out of Vancouver, going to Alaska for one day, and then we're moving on to Japan. And it's basically a 14-day cruise. But I think it's 15 because of the dateline. Something like something funky with the dateline. But let me get the dates. Uh, September 4th to the 20th. And we arrive in Tokyo. Um, then you're going to fly back. It's a one-way. It's a relocation cruise. So we're going to Japan. And then you can stay there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how long. You can visit Tokyo, which I think we're all going to do. Uh, and then basically check out that place and then um, come back. So that's exciting. Check the website for that. I don't have a lot of the details memorized or written down. You'd think I'd be prepared, but I'm not. <laughs> and I'm really not prepared for this because it's sort of up in the air. Um, in 2021, we're going to Barcelona, sailing Mediterranean. We get to go to... Um, so we start out of Barcelona, and then we go to Rome, a bunch of places in Italy, um, something in France, too. All the details, though, are on the website. So check that out. That's 2021. I know a lot of people need to plan ahead of time. That's June 27th to the to July 4th. Hey, you get to watch people wear American uh, flag shirts all on the cruise. That's pretty cool. Um, that'd be 2021. I know that's a long way away, but I put it up there because this, tickets are going actually pretty fast. Yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> it's, a, it's these once in a life. There's two once in a lifetime cruises coming back to back. So check those out. 15 days in Japan to Japan, I should say. And then a Mediterranean. I think that's a regular seven. Yeah. Looks like a seven day. Um, but all the details are on the website. Check them out. Prices, all that stuff. The prices for the 21, 2021 cruise may adjust because that we're so far ahead that they haven't even put the publishing of it. I don't know. It's all this cruise stuff about publishing dates and all that. So it's confusing. Can I just say too, Scott, that if anyone's yeah. hearing this and, and it's their first time maybe even considering going on a cruise and you've got questions about what that involves, uh, people in the forums have been really helpful in trying to give people yeah. advice as well. So feel free to just post in the forums if you have questions about it. I had someone email me directly because, of course, I went on it as well and, and happy to help if people have questions like that. Definitely. Um, and you can email us. Um, I think BGG at C, but BGGCon at BoardGameGeek.com if you want to just direct, email us directly about stuff. Um, Jeff is really um, active on that email, so he'll get back to you right away. All right, I'm going to stop talking now because I bit my tongue, if you can't tell, and i um, <laughs> going to turn it over turn it over to uh, Eric. Eric, we're going to Essen, right? Yes, we are almost set with our Spiel 19 live stream. We have 40 hours out of the 41 hours that we will be broadcasting scheduled. So wow. A few slots for a few, few more people. Five more games, maybe. That's about it. Uh, the broadcasting will begin on Wednesday, October 23rd at 10 o'clock SN time. That's UTC plus two. Here, adjust for your local time zone. Broadcasting through about 6.30 each evening. So eight and a half hours. That's yeah, a long day. Yes. Sunday's a little shorter. But eight and a half hours of games, roughly a new game every five or ten minutes, just onslaught. We'll be live streaming on uh, twitch.tv slash boardgamegeektv, so you can catch that. And it's also going to be on the BGG front page. And after the show ends, the videos will be chopped into pieces, edited, and put onto the BGG Express channel on YouTube. You should subscribe to that channel. It's a separate uh, channel from the regular Board Game Geek channel. And that, that will let you know when we have new videos going. Now, part of the reason for it going to its own channel was people were upset about the notifications uh, because there's so many notifications whenever we have an event. But it's a fantastic uh, way to see what new games are. Some of these are the only videos that will be out there for, for these games. And there's so many games to learn about. <laughs> and I think most of the games we're doing are not repeats, right, Eric? Yes. The idea is if we have covered something at Gen Con, we should not be covering it at Spiel just because we can't even cover everything new at Spiel. Even with us doing probably another 300 videos, we are not covering even a third, I think, of the new titles that are out. We ask publishers, pick a couple, pick the two things you want to highlight. We have that. So that way we can cover as many publishers as possible, but not every game. Except for like Stephen Bonacore, because he usually brings about 20 boxes and just <laughs> makes a mountain of them on the table. <laughs> yes, and he talks about each one for 15 seconds. And that's yeah. <laughs> okay, so everybody's favorite segment, of course, 
what have you been playing, Steph? Why don't you kick us off? I have been playing so much. It's been amazing. Um, Meepo Games actually sent me a couple of their, their new releases that are coming out of Essen, Carousel and Porto, but I wanted to touch on Porto because it, it's awesome. <laughs> um, so it's really kind of light, and I it, it kind of gives me the feeling of Copenhagen, but not. So it has the pretty pastel colors. You're, bu- you're building up these buildings, but instead it's a competitive one board everybody's building to the same board where you're trying to get your goals for different building patterns and get points for these building patterns um so you're placing you're either drafting cards or you're placing floors down in these buildings and um the whole production is just gorgeous and i played the solo mode and i lost i like i lost i was (laughs) so hard (laughs) Um, and I also got to play it two player and it, it was awesome. It, it works both ways really well. So if you're a solo gamer, that's good news. <laughs> um, so it, it's kind of like a, a medium light kind of game. New, new gamers or entry level gamers could easily play that one. So is it like a dexterity game or is it a strategic? Oh, no, no, no. It's a strategic. You are collecting okay. cards and these cards will have numbers one through three on them. And it, what you'll use one card to tell you how many floors and the other card will tell you what color floors and you're building up these buildings. It's like, it's sort of abstract, but not, it's more take the best chance to get points when you can, because there's common goals and you have your end goals. So you're trying to just work with what the board is giving you at the time when you can. So um, it's not dexterity at all. (laughs) Okay. And that's by Mebo coming out in the U S maybe. Well, they did get uh, Ariel. Uh, I don't know how to say it properly. Ariel? Ariel, yeah. I don't even think that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Ariel or something. Oh, right. Yeah. Who knows? Hopefully, Porto will get picked up as well because, you know, who knows? I hope so. It's really good. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Eric, what have you been playing? So I have been previewing as many Spiel titles as possible. Uh, One of the ones people are really looking forward to is Last Bastion. The new version of Ghost Stories by Antoine Bauza and Repost Production. It's interesting. If you played Ghost Stories, it came out in 2008. It's like a different era at that time. Yeah. Um, had a couple of expansions. It got very convoluted. There's a lot, long FAQ answering all sorts of timing details. So part of the reason of coming out with this new game was to streamline everything and present the core of the game in a new way. But as a standalone game, separate It's not ghost stories. It is a fantasy setting where you are defending a castle. So the gameplay feels very much like ghost stories. So you have a grid of three by three tiles, each one with a different power. Each player is a hero. Each hero has a unique power. You are trying to defend this castle against monsters that are attacking it, along with one or more warlords, depending on the difficulty level of the deck that you set up. Monsters come out on the colored board. So yellow will go on yellow and blue on blue and everything. Yeah, everything's all very familiar. Uh, The black monsters come out on your board if you draw them from the deck on your turn. And you have to defend the board by killing all the monsters. And the long-term goal is killing the warlord. So at the start of the turn, monsters have effects. Usually there's these grasp of evil tokens that move onto the monsters and then start sweeping across your board. And if you get three of those on your board, you lose the game. As they cover a tile, you, you lose the power of that tile. The, the Grasp of Evil tokens also go onto you, the heroes, and you lose your special power. So you're fighting this constantly. There's a wave of tokens. You have to defeat monsters by going up next to them and rolling dice to fight them. Maybe you have tokens to add to that combat ability. Uh, But those tokens keep getting sucked away as well, along with your life points, along with your hopes and dreams. (laughs) Everything just goes away. It is very much the feel of ghost stories um, with a new clean look by Piero. I played three times. We've lost all three times. We actually saw the warlord (laughs) once. But otherwise, it's just it's it's luck and strategy mixed together. You can make good plans for what you're going to do. I'm going to go here. We're going to set this trap and so forth. And I'm going to be on the same space with you. We'll share our tokens so that you can fight together. And then one thing comes up and it's just a domino effect of terrible things happening. And then suddenly you're just like, oh, I'm dead. 
you can be revived and brought back without your special power. And if you're killed again, you're you're dead, dead. <laughs> not not permanent. Well, I remember the original game was quite punishing. Was is the uh, but the rule book of the original game was pretty punishing as well. H- how'd you find learning this one? This one seemed more straightforward. They have a special pamphlet that has the board powers uh, okay. on one side, the hero powers on one side, the monster powers, the die powers. It's all separated so you can pass it around and you can look at things. Hmm. Everything seems relatively straightforward. I oh, do good. not remember hero powers. I don't know if I'm just forgetting that or that was introduced in one of the expansions. It was in the base game. It is in the base game? I'm yeah. I'm forgetting that. But that's all there. And it seems relatively straightforward. And a lot of the turns are often just like, I move here, I roll, I failed. That's my turn. So sometimes it's very straightforward and sometimes you're more trying to plan several turns out. So it keeps that aspect. And, you know, now it's new. It's new again. It kind of seems what publishers have to do also to get a, attention on a game, relaunch it, retheme it, put it out again. It'll get another year or two on the market. Well, that game's fantastic. I'm really glad that they... Because, you know, the availability of some of that stuff was back and forth on the expansions and, and the base game. So to give it a, a new launch and change it up a bit is awesome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I remember, like, Ghost Stories only winning, like, nine times, or one in nine, one in ten times. So does this seem... It sounds like this is the same difficulty it's, level. It seems the same so far. I mean, there's some things where it's just like, if only this, except you say, you know, you don't know what would have come after that. If only this hadn't happened, this plan would happen. We had a trap here for this monster and, you know, yeah. whatever. But then sometimes you draw monsters and then they have a come on come into play effect where either you draw another monster or you roll the die or you lose tokens or you do whatever mm-hmm. and just, you know, you're getting hammered. So it's the same. Now, do but you think no. it's going to have the same amount of problems or have they just fleshed out all those problems from the previous rules? It seems like it doesn't have timing issues. I haven't noticed anything yet in the three games where it was unclear what would happen. Sometimes we would go back through and look at something. Well, if I defeat a monster and I get a token, can I use it against another monster? Because if you're in the corner, you can fight two at once. No, you can't. It's very clear. You roll the dice, here are the effects, here's what happens, and then the monsters go away, and then you get effects. And it seems okay. it seems well done. With a, right. a decade more experience. I'm looking forward to it. Definitely on my top 10. Most anticipated. <laughs> How about you, Roddy? What have you been playing? Well, I've been playing uh, Final Hour. This is, a, this is a game that this says on the bo- back of the box is playable in 60 minutes or less. And it's set in the Arkham world. And I don't know. Like I feel like there's been a few different games that have attempted to uh, slim down Arkham Horror, right? There was, uh, well, there was Arkham Horror, and then I think Eldritch Horror kind of provide, I think, an easier to teach streamlined experience. And then there's like actually an Arkham Horror third edition that just came out, which I believe, again, is meant to sort of uh, make it a little easier to get into. So this, I was thinking when I first heard about the announcement, was going to be just another version of Arkham, but maybe some things stripped away. And it really is a, a very different game altogether, but it does have the feel still of an Arkham game. Uh, it, 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 in short, thematically, it's set in uh, the Miskatonic University, and where normally you're trying to stop a ritual from happening. Well, that's still sort of the case, but it's almost too late. Uh, the horrible monsters are already ripping through time and space, and the world's in, in real danger. We're trying to now reverse the ritual. We've got one hour to stop it, because it's, <laughs> it's well underway now. That's right. And it's uh, not 24. This... It's one. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. It's the yeah. final hour. The yes. final. You could say it's the final hour. Yeah. You could say it's the final hour. <laughs> <laughs> it all happens here on, on this lovely board, and uh, one of the, I mean, again, it just plays very differently. I'm, I'm very nervous about how I'm going to try to explain this, but essentially, everyone's going to have their own player deck. So here's uh, Jenny Barnes, and Jenny Barnes has her own special abilities on these cards, but you're also going to have four cards dealt from this other little deck, one of the little famous Fantasy Flight decks, small decks, and this has got, they're just numbered cards from one to something, I forget now, but one to something, and uh, on your turn, you're going to be taking uh, the one card you draw from your deck and pairing it with one of the cards, one of these numbered cards. But you cannot communicate with the other players about what value you're placing, or even really what's on the card that you're playing. And what's important about this 
is once everyone has placed their card in their number pairing, the numbers will be revealed. And then the two lowest numbers will resolve first. And every uh, ability card that you have from your deck has an upper and a lower half. The first two people will get to resolve the upper half. The second two people, the ones with the two highest numbers, will have to resolve the bottom half. And the bottom half is generally not great. It's not wonderful stuff. Uh, the top half is generally your really good stuff. So it's really a challenge when you're sitting there going like, well, I really want to play this top half, but it's not, well, I think an eight will be enough. And then two other players play like a three and a four because they really don't want to play their bottom half, right? So there's this little weird tension in the timing. Uh, but there's also other considerations you have to make, like these cards will also have eyeballs on them. The more collective eyeballs that everyone exposes at the end of the round, the nastier <laughs> Cthulhu's going to be. Okay, because Cthulhu loves eyeballs, apparently. Okay, That's right. The really cool conceits of this game uh, is that on the, the board here at the bottom, uh, here, at the bottom, this half here, you might be able to see there's, there's all these little circles here with symbols. So at the beginning of the game, you're going to get a bunch of tokens, one for each one of these symbols. So there's uh, five of them, and there's, uh, they repeat. Okay, so there's two copies of each. You're going to mix these all up, Two of them unseen you're going to remove, and the rest you're going to place face down the board. And really what you're trying to do is get around to these on the board and flip them over. Because if you can find these symbols, it means that these symbols are not the two that were set aside at the beginning. And the ones that were set aside at the beginning are the ritual symbols. These are what you're trying to discover so that you can then stop everything. So you're running around the board trying to investigate these symbols while fighting monsters and keeping the university being, from being overrun. So you can try to deduce what the last two symbols are because at the very end of the game, to win the game, what you need to do is have some cards in your hand left over. The numbered cards also have the, the ritual symbols on them. You want the, the ones that match those ritual symbols so you can collectively play enough of them to win the game. It's a little bit difficult to explain in the abstract, but I, what I really wanted to emphasize is that it feels... Like I said, the, it feel has the oppression of an <laughs> Arkham Horror game where everything's just going to hell in a handbasket. But it does play quickly, and it is very different. It doesn't feel like any of the other Arkham games that I have. So I'm very happy to have this in my collection. And everyone I've played it with has really enjoyed it. And it does play in under an hour. And it's a really uh, tense hour. I've only had one game where it was kind of a cakewalk. Uh, every other one I've played has been right down to the wire. And there's different levels of difficulty as well. So I, I think if you like Arkham uh, and those kind of games and you like a difficult co-op, uh, this is one I'd recommend. Final hour. It's hard to investigate, too. To be able to reveal yes. those tokens is much, much more challenging than you would... I mean, that's part of the greatness of the game, but holy cow. We, had a, we, we came so close and we still get... You know, like, we're one or two clues away from actually having it pretty clear and we, and we guessed poorly. Uh, in the game that I played recently, but I also, we played it and the it chain reaction of things ha bad things happening ended the game very quickly, too. It, it's, that sounds it's familiar. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like an Arkham game, doesn't it? Well, that's something interesting, Lincoln, that you brought, though. I'm glad you mentioned that, because that's one of the neat things about the game is, even if you don't know what the final two symbols are, hopefully you've eliminated enough of them to have a sense of it's. I think it's one of these three or one of these four. Well, as a last-ditch effort, you can just guess as a group. Like, I think it might be these two symbols, so I'll play as many of those cards from my hand as I can. So you, you can sometimes get a very nice, dramatic, lucky win at the end, if you're lucky. Well, plus you got to hold on to the right cards. Having yeah. the, the wrong symbols on the cards for ones that are disqualified, right? You know it's not these. So yeah. you're trying to make up the, the best way you can amongst, like, which cards should we spend so that we have something at the end <laughs> right. to even yeah. submit an answer, right? You know. That's right, that's right. You're, you're, you're actually... You're saving the cards and you're worrying about how many eyeballs are on there because you don't want Cthulhu freaking out. You're worrying about the, the value because you want to play maybe a low number versus a high. And you're worrying about the symbols because you want to collect them for the end of the game. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of fun little tensions there pulling you in all directions. Yeah, it's, it's spectacular. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Lincoln, what about you? What have you been playing lately? I got to play finally the full-on version of Funkoverse uh we played it on the cruise, the Funkoverse strategy game. We played uh, Harry Potter, and um, it is fantastic. I'm going to pull a little bit of a Rodney here. I've got the game board. This is Diagon Alley, which was fantastic. <laughs> and it has this really great um, video game type system where you can play your cards. So your character card 
has what color tokens you can use, you need to use to do your special actions. And one of the cards, uh, one of the actions on the Harry Potter one was Flipendo, which is fantastic. But you spend the token, and this puts it on, this one here says four. So you put it on this cooldown track, which is very video game, and you put the token on here, and it stays. And then uh, at <laughs> each, each time, it'll, it'll drop down one level, and then once it finally falls off, you can actually use that token once again. Um, and it's fantastic because you have these powers that you're desperate to use, but you have to time them properly because the way it works is the um, star player marker, it goes from one side to the other, then it repeats, right? They'll be their final turn because they're not the star player, then they're the star player. So you're trying to time up a double turn with the, with right. the powers that you have, and you only get at most two symbols of each kind. Um, and the, the way that all works out is really great. I love the cooldown track. You're really trying to, should we spend it now? Should we hold off? Can we pair it up so that it's going to work out? And there is a little overlap because in the case of Harry Potter and Hermione here, they both use the yellow. And the yellow is very, very powerful for Harry. Not so great for Hermione. Still not bad. So do we use it for Hermione? This is a pretty great thing. Some of the things like advance the tokens back to you, but you're like, well, we've already spent both of them, so we're not going to be able to do that. Um, it's great, and I love the way that the characters, you know, that of course they have the fantastic Funko characters, miniatures, and it's another size, you know, everybody's going to buy this game just because of these, uh, t here's me trying to yank them out. They don't come out easily, I'll tell you that. But we'll look at uh, Voldemort here. Voldemort's fantastic, he's a little bit bigger uh, <laughs> than the little tiny ones we've seen, and much smaller than the regular ones. Uh, the only funny thing for us is like figuring out, we had to decide when they fall down on the board, so when they're down, how do we do them? Is it going to be based on their head or their body? We decided since their <laughs> right, head was a big yeah. thing we would do with that. Um, really, really, really great. I, I thought it was fun before, but playing the true game is fantastic. And one of my favorite elements is there are these... In this game, we were playing basically capture the flag kind of a thing. Um, you put these tokens on the board, and these are win tokens, but these are temporary. So you put them on the cooldown track, and they stay there until they drop off. So if you can meet the win uh, conditions while these are still on the track they count as victory points for you to win uh, it's not they're they're not really victory points they're the uh objectives right so you need, in, in this game we needed six so if you could have some of these on the board like this while they're in play uh then that counts as uh the conditions we i don't think any of us maybe we did it on our team but uh, the other team could not they just kept going down too quickly for you to actually make it work. But it's fun because it's a neat little uh, pressure to get your timing done as fast as possible. Really, really great game. So you played it with four players? We did play it with four. It is a two-player game, but it plays great with four, actually. Okay, because um, I've only played it with two players, and I really liked controlling two characters, but I could see how being a team could be fun, too. It's fun to talk that stuff out. We, uh, we played with AJ, and he was just great. I mean, he's a video game guy, too, so he was, like, really thinking in those terms. It was really fantastic. What have you been playing, Scott? Funnily enough, I am also have been playing a dueling game, much like Funkoverse. However, this one is up to not level 9 or 10 complexity. It's called Black Rose Wars, which was a Kickstarter from... I feel like it was three or two... To, it's probably at least two years ago. Finally got delivered. Wow. We cracked it open. We cold read the rule. I mean, we opened it up and it's just lusciously filled with very colorful <laughs> um, map tiles stuff. You would love it. Uh, oh I mean, every every <laughs> tile had like a rainbow sheen, right? I mean, it was very cool. Um, uh, basically, the premise is it's four mages well, in a four player game. They go to the lodge to battle it out to see who's like the best mage in the Black Rose. I don't know. Like the universe is a little weird. I didn't really read the backstory, <laughs> but uh, the cool thing is, is you get to mix and match your, um, your mages. So you like can start out as a necromancer, which is what I did. Um, and you can add every turn to your, um, your grimoire, more spells from other schools of magic. And I believe uh, with the expansion, there are seven. So, you could, since I started as Necromancer, I added a little elemental magic and then I added a little myth magic and I added a little disruption magic. I don't know. There were, there's a whole bunch of different types, which is cool. So I'm basically building my spell book as we're playing. Now, I should not like this game because I don't love programming games. However, you pre program your turn by putting spells on your 
player board. And then as you play the turn, you're exposing them one at a time, right? So I'm casting a spell. I'm moving. I'm casting my second spell, doing something else. And then I'm casting my third. Once I've cast all my spells and I've done all my moves. Oh, I also have a quick spell, which I can do in, uh, in addition to a standard spell. Then my turn is done, right? So turns end early or later because maybe I don't have as many spells. I'm building up power. Mm. Someone plays all their spells. They're doing like 10 things. So it has that kind of cool, do I hold back now, build up power, or do I go all out and try to kill as many mages as possible? Uh, victory points. It, so this is a killing game. You are de- you are defeating other people. Points are scored by defeating other mages. You um, finish quests. There are secret quests that you can get. Uh, and also destroying the lodge itself. So basically, as you cast <laughs> spells, they're so devastating that they do damage to the rooms you're in. And, and when a room gets damaged, the person who did the most gets to claim the, the trophy for that room. <laughs> I don't think these wizards are getting invited back to the lodge. <laughs> but the lodge, man, I mean, <laughs> the, uh, the Black Rose regenerates the lodge every time. I don't know what, what the thing. So there's this mysterious oh, okay. Black Rose room, which is, we're like, what is that? Oh, it doesn't come into play until midway through the game. And the Black Rose room lets you get very powerful, like very overpowered spells called the Forgotten. Um, and once you cast one of the forgotten spells, it's out of the game. So it doesn't like get, let you keep doing it. Uh, for instance, my forgotten spell was basically, I would turn, what was it? I, no, I would, uh, <laughs> I had, I had a, ba- you draw three and you pick one, right? One of those things. So my spell was like something about like revenge is sweet or sweet revenge or something like that, where if someone killed me, I would not die. And instead they would die. Which is crazy, right? Because you're playing this game in order to kill people. So I'm like, I, I, someone, of course, and the, the damage is bloody in this game. You're summoning monsters. You're moving those two and they hit hard. You are casting direct damage spells. You're setting up traps. You have protection. I'm overwhelmed by the amount of stuff in this game. We're, we were all kind of blown away we're, as we're reading things. We're like, wow, this game has that too. And that, and that, and that. And it's very... It's definitely not a beginner game. And if you don't like, take that because this is all about zapping people and setting up traps and accomplishing goals. Um, I would not recommend it to the faint hearted. You're going to get killed and you're going to get killed a lot. Um, Even if you kill Scott, you're going to get killed, apparently. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah. The, the revenge card was really. There was a little saltiness at the table, I have to I'm say. Sure. Because we're Euro gamers mostly. But when you. You know, when you pick on one person, they kind of it gets a little like. You have to be prepared for that because if you're the yeah. target, if I, as a programming game, if I've set up my you know, whirlwind spell and you're not and you're the only person in the, in range of me, you're getting it in the face, right? So, <laughs> it's it's sort of one of those like, yeah, you're you're at the wrong place at the wrong time, so you're getting the oh my god, the meteor storm. Well, was, let me just explain one scenario. The uh, Troy basically played the whirlwind. He was more of a, a mythical, um, you know, like, like uh, I think it was Greek mythology um, character. And that was an expansion. So that's not in the base game. But if you bought the Kickstarter, you probably got the expansion. He cast a whirlwind that basically swept the entire board into one space. And then Mike on my right played Meteor Storm, which basically just destroyed every single thing in that space. So we were like, <laughs> wow, that thanks, Troy, for setting him up for the perfect Meteor Storm. But if you like that kind of stuff, if that's evocative, and there's there's seven decks of spells with 30, 30 plus cards in each deck. And there's a couple a couple repeats, but the rule book, I mean, not, this is stuff I really like makes me love board gaming. The rule book's like 30 pages of reference, and every single spell card is detailed. And every room has a power. It's one of those games, right? So lots of rules, lots of effects, lots of exceptions. However, along with that comes very much um, ambiguity in the rules. We were making things up. It is a foreign translation, I believe, from French, maybe Italian. I don't remember. But, like, eh, we had at least a dozen questions after our game. Now, we figured it out. We kind of just made the right move. But if if you're looking for, like, a pure, very clean, no problem game, this is not that. But if you're looking for the very thematic blow each other up, bl- summon giant miniatures that move around and smack people down. This is that game for you. Much like Funkoverse, but like a little bit on the more advanced side. Next level, yeah, for sure. Next level. Black Two Rose Wars. <laughs> we blew us all the way. We were like, wow. Thank God for Kickstarter for this to be able to have this game cre- created, right? One of those things. 
It's a lot of lot of game inside there and a lot of miniatures and stuff. Big, big giant miniatures, lots of cool sculptures. you you know, every monster you summon is, has got its miniature. Awesome. So hopefully you can buy it. This is another problem. The blessing and curse of crowdfunding. They made enough games to distribute to their founder to the funders, but now what? Right? Like me talking about this game right now is maybe a problem, right? Because now if you're interested, you can't buy it. I don't know. But uh, I suspect it'll be crowd, you know, it'll get an, a second print run. Maybe you can buy it from them directly. I don't, yeah, it's one of those things. Ludus Magnus Studio, the publisher of Black Rose Wars, will be at Spiel and will have it the game for sale. So they have some copies. I don't know how yeah. many, but there's some out there. Presumably they'll have some expansions as well. So you do have a chance to there, get it. There's actually, I need to co- check out because I know I've heard that they put out a couple more expansions that I did not back and I don't know why I didn't back them because usually when I do the backings, I get every little add on and every little thing. So it's like a complete set, sort of completionist that way. I know that's a, a thing. <laughs> 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 yep, sort of. That's so it. hopefully I can stop by the booth. Um, there was a couple, like we were playing and we, I think I, at one point, one of the guys turned into a, a minotaur and like there was no, miniature for that so it turns into a token right so maybe they made a miniature oh, for that min- that minotaur. It. i don't know yeah because it's weird because the expansion was like the the mythical stuff and it didn't have that miniature but maybe there was another add-on i don't know. it's a little overwhelming sometimes keeping track of like what is available for a, for a game like this it needs a new rule book for sure, Rodney. If you have any swing for them, it's just like, well, <laughs> please, well, please figure. Well, maybe out if they rules. do a second, uh, if they do a second Kickstarter, maybe they'll clean it up. I, I don't know if you saw, yeah. but Joan of Arc has, is re-releasing, and they've got a 1.5 rule book that's going to be released with that to clean it up. I'm going to make a huge plea to people, to the publishers. Please, someone clip this, post it on the internet, share it. Let's go viral. <laughs> please, please, blind play test with Americans, not Americans specifically, English speakers in your, I know you, you guys know the game. You know why this happens when that happens and that happens and this happens. You know the game, you made it. We don't know those things. If I recorded our gameplay video for you, you would be horrified. We blew it apart. Please let blind play testers with English speakers with your English rules, please. The community, we board game geek is a oh, 2.2 million users. We just, we just crested that point. There's a lot of people out there who will do it for you probably for free or for a copy of the game at a minimum, but please hire somebody who <laughs> wants to do this. It's important. It'll make your game better. There we go. Clip that. <laughs> I endorse that wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah. I love you. You make amazing games. There's problems though. <laughs> a little bit of a little bit of problem. Anyway, okay. Moving on. Let's move on to some news, Eric. I think we've got a big announcement. So what's the deal with the new Gloomhaven, Eric? So Isaac Childress was at the Shucks convention, the Shut Up and Sit Down convention that took place this past week. Last weekend from when this is recorded. And made an announcement of Gloomhaven subtitle, which is not the official name of the game. Apparently that's a placeholder. Isaac doesn't want any meta meta references there. So the idea behind Gloomhaven subtitle <laughs> name to be finished later, it will be coming out in Q3 2020. It will be a 24 scenario campaign with what you need to play sort of as at a minimum with a 40 to $50 price tag things still to be determined and talking about the game on Twitter, which is the only place he's been talking about it. He mentioned uh, when people were suggesting names that he'll have to talk with Target about that. So probably a Target exclusive item. Wow. That has not been officially announced, but he made that reference, which suggests that it will be Target exclusive in Q3 is when they generally introduce their new titles for the year. And there you go. It's a standalone game. It is a prequel to the events of Gloomhaven and... The material included in that game, my understanding, can be used also in Gloomhaven itself. So characters and other things. So there are three, I believe, many new classes and fewer scenarios. Like there's not the thirteen hundred and sixty-five thousand scenarios like in the main Gloomhaven. <laughs> it's just like it's like what thirteen or maybe twenty-four. I, I can't remember exactly how many, but it just I was 24. so excited because twenty-four. I haven't played Gloomhaven. I look at it and go, 
I would love to. It sounds amazing. Uh, Isaac's obviously done something really ambitious and cool here. I have no idea where that would fit in my lifestyle. Uh, and this feels like something that, oh, this, this is approachable. I could actually maybe get to enjoy the mechanics of Gloomhaven right. and actually fool myself into believing I might actually be able to complete this one. You know, whereas with Gloomhaven, I know I can't. <laughs> this is the version for 40-year-old Rodney, whereas the yes. original game is 20-year-old <laughs> right. Rodney. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Pre-family. Yeah. A lot yeah. Of time, Though there's no legacy elements in this game, as I understand. Right. No stickers all, or anything, I don't think. No stickers, no envelopes, no hidden puzzles, stuff like that. And this is not a kickstarted item. Direct to stores. Or store. Store. <laughs> Target has a lot of stores, if that is it. Yeah. That's a real score for Target. Scott messaged me about it. He's like, hey, you can maybe finally play Gloomhaven on game night. So uh, it's yeah. definitely a possibility. That I think that definitely could happen. If this is indeed a Target pickup, yes, it's great for them. Because part of what they seem to be doing is not just broadening the type of games they have for their own customer base, but pulling in customers who will then also recommend other people go to Target to get more games. So the casual person looking at this, I'll be curious to see how it's marketed to them and how it's explained on the back of the box. Usually on the back of all those boxes, you got a one, two, three scenario of how to play, you know, cause you gotta, you gotta give people the idea of the game in a minute. You have to grasp it immediately and be like, Oh, I'm going to explore this and take it home. That's all the time you have. So, be curious to see how they do this. Well, the, definitely Gloomhaven, the name, is getting around the media a lot too, right? So I see it in many places that are not board game related. So that's already that may be one reason why Target's really excited about it. You know, it's it's got the name recognition. It'll pro, it'll have a price that's palatable for a lot of folks, even though you can get really good de good deals on the the main game. And Asmodee Digital just released Digital Gloomhaven, so that will as well cultivate a customer base for it or give people an additional way to get into the game. Absolutely. The other big title uh, that, that I found interesting, Minecraft Builders and Biomes. Wait, you have it? <laughs> oh. You got a copy? I do have a copy. Oh, my God, Eric. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> That's right. Well, you can get one as well if you go to Spiel. I'll have them there. Yeah. Well, in you German. got one before Spiel. Sure. Well, <laughs> yes. I, I preview some games sometimes. So Builders and Myomes, it's by designer Ulrich Bloom, a two to four player game. It's all on the tabletop, nothing digital here, but you are trying to harvest the blocks. Oh, it's gotta be lots of blocks here that you construct into a four by four by four cube. And you're going to be moving your character around the world. You can pick up weapons. You try to fight creepers, other people, and you're building things on your own personal three by three building board and you're going to score points three times during the game when all the blocks in the first layer are gone, then the second layer, and then the third layer. So you're, that's the timer in the game. And you're trying to score based on the type of building or the type of landscape. It differs for the different things you're doing. Will this be readily available in the U.S.? Because it sounds awesome. <laughs> I believe, oh, it's something of a theme. I believe that Minecraft would be available exclusively in Target initially. Well, how about that? <laughs> yes, from Robinsberger. Robinsberger! Robinsberger and Target are working together with Villainous. And they've done some other things with Jaws. Right. So now here's another one. Minecraft for the target audience and then at least in the mainstream. Uh, in other markets, there's many different languages on the box. So in Europe, it will be available, as I understand it, through general retailers. It will be available at Spiel and out in November in the U.S. All right. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Board Game Geek Show. Wow, this one was really interesting, <laughs> let's say. Okay. Uh, let's all go around the table and say what you're working on. How about you, Rodney? What do you got coming up this well, week? Well, I've got, uh, let's see, Fantastic Factories is a game I've got a tutorial coming out for. Uh, and that's a really fun uh, engine building style game. And also, uh, I have a solo game that I'm doing. It's exclusively solo, Cristallo. And uh, that's from uh, Liberty Kiefer. And it'll be releasing towards the last half of October. And I'm working on one other kind of big box thing. It's a reprint of a game. And... Uh, I don't know if I can say it. Or, yeah, I guess I can say it. Uh, I'm doing Catan Starfarers, which is the new reprint. It's a, a b brilliant reproduction yeah. of the original game. I haven't played the original game. Okay, I can't review at all. So I, I'll, I'll, sh I'll stop there. And I'll just say <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a new version of the game. So keep an eye out for that on the channel. 
Oh, exciting. That's coming back. I'm excited. I'll say that much. I like it. How about you? Uh, well, we have, we filmed a bunch of game nights recently, uh, trying to get a bunch of folks in before we go to Essen and have episodes ready. Cause we have a, basically about a month of, uh, convention type stuff happening where we have very little time at home. So we filmed, uh, as I said, Funko pop, uh, Harry Potter, and we filmed, uh, planet from blue orange games. And we, uh, have some more filming this week. So, I'm and still trying to prepare for uh, Essen, so uh, it's a tremendous amount of stuff, but good stuff coming. Steph, what have you got going on? Oh, so there's a really cool new show on BGG, the YouTube, called 10v10 with the Merc Brothers. So I will be joining them um, in future episodes to help say what my favorite 10 games are uh, alongside with the BGG list that everybody votes on BGG. So that's an exciting new project. <laughs> So is it top 10 by mechanism or theme or category or? It could be anything that we choose, anything. right? You could pick top 10 Reiner Knizia games, maybe. I don't know. Some, all kinds of stuff, right? Anything that's got a lot, a big value, a uh, pool of stuff to choose from and see what we match up with, what we don't match up with. We might end up running polls and stuff like that to see, uh, to, de to determine like the, uh, crap. Cause not everything can be selected as a group, right, um, on BGG. So maybe we have polls in advance and stuff like that, but uh, it's fun. The first episode went up last Friday, and at, right now it's probably going to be every two weeks, hopefully. Um, maybe more, maybe more, maybe less. We've got to see how much effort it takes, because there's actually research that has to happen on, on that show. So Can I choose a top ten? Yeah. Top ten games with sheep? Oh, gosh, I have ten. <laughs> I definitely have ten. <laughs> That's right. With googly eyes. Anyway. <laughs> Do the Brothers Merc so, have 10. <laughs> have you picked your next topic yet, Steph? Have you, got, have you I all believe, decided um, on a topic? I think it's cooperative games. Oh, nice. Definitely a category I love. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Eric, how about you? I know you've got um, bold plans for two the next two weeks. Yeah, you... we'll, we'll see how much I actually get done. i got certain things to focus on, like perhaps the Minecraft game. I should probably show that off since people might be looking forward to what it is like to play. Uh, more definitely, Ferron. It's a one to five player game by Catch Up Games, a French studio, in which you are all youths who are trying to prepare for the afterlife, sort of. As a pharaoh, you gotta you gotta take care of things in the life and then the afterlife as well. It's resource collection. Get do things. That's such an overdone points. theme. Oh my yeah. gosh! No, it's. I mean, it's it's a standard sort of euro game with collecting stuff and doing stuff with the stuff. You know that type of stuff. Uh, but uh, uh, but the the rule book is fascinating. As a child of the pharaoh, you will dedicate a huge part of your life to preparing your journey in the afterlife. Each of your actions will be judged during the weighing of your heart. I like it. Yeah. I'm intrigued. I, I love themes that I just don't ever expect to see. And then, boom, someone does it. It's great. That's right. They could lean in more with a promo with actual hearts. I don't know. Just <laughs> something at Spiel to, to really drive that home. We'll see. A few canop canopic jars filled with bodily fluids and yeah. organs. <laughs> Yes, oh customs goodness. will love that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on a um, programming thing. I'm not going to finish it before us, though, unfortunately. We're trying to make the site responsive, everybody. Remember, to use on your phones, tablets, other computer things that don't have, you know, 10 million pixels wide. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm still working on that. It's a process, so... Not exciting, but it is exciting to be able to use it all. It's exciting internally. Hopefully it'll be exciting to you when we uh, launch that. It would have been exciting to us this weekend when we search for all those black rose uh, <laughs> rules. <laughs> mm. All right. Well, thank you everybody for watching. That wraps up another episode of the Board Game Geek Show. Thank you to my lovely co-host, Lincoln Dammers, Steph Hodge, Rodney Smith. The, I was at Rodney W. Smith. Rodney Smith, <laughs> W. Eric Martin. <laughs> I'm your host, Scott Alden. Thank you for watching, and thank you for subscribing and clicking that bell to be notified of new episodes. And watch for us live from Spiel. That's Starting right. Wednesday, the 23rd of October, we will have a live BGG show from Essen. And that'll go up on the regular BGG channel after we return. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.